Hello, this is uh, Alan May. I will be the moderator for this uh, one-hour session. So um, uh, welcome to this OWASP uh, 2022 uh, virtual AppSec EU uh, session. Uh, the presenter is Michael uh, Borinens. I will uh, uh, ask him to introduce himself. I will say a few things after, and then we'll start. Uh, go ahead, uh, Michael. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so hi, hi everyone. Um, in fact, I, I moved my slide to introduce myself to the end, just to do something different. Uh, so, but I really want to cover the content uh, today. So let's see if we get to, to my bio slide. It's not the most important thing uh, that I want to talk to you about. But so today is about uh, layered threat modeling. Um, layered threat modeling in the sense that we distinguish multiple layers in, in the, the threat modeling as we all know it. And that's really what I, what I would like to talk to you about and see also what your uh, opinions are or perhaps questions that you may have. So this is presented by myself. There is a co-creator, Matthijs Hubrechtsen, who really helped me a lot in creating these slides, uh, who also works together with me in, uh, in Splinter. So just as a short agenda, we, we have a, a small hour. Um, and I, I really have some things that I, that I would like to talk about. Um, but it's about layered threat modeling. And I first want to introduce uh, the difference also with solution threat modeling. And I also want to cover some of the literature uh, review, the methodologies, frameworks that actually support this, this layering. And so it's not something that, that we invented ourselves. This talk is basically a summary of things that we uh, have read and that we think are useful in, in practice. Now, to make it a bit more concrete for this talk, I actually um, use the cloud as a problem statement, as, a, as an example, uh, because you know it's always difficult in these talks to, to use real live examples from customers. Uh, it's, it's not really allowed typically. And so I created this cloud service model example which in the end, actually, I must say, even though I say it myself, which, which I will definitely be using in the future, because I think it's pretty useful and pretty, uh, a pretty nice model if you ever need to uh, assess the difference between cloud service models like EAS, PaaS, uh, CAS, etc., and so on. So we will cover that as well. And then I want to deep dive in the method, which is if you know solution threat modeling, and I call solution threat modeling the, the traditional threat modeling type of way, if you know that this, this method is not new, so we model the context, we identify threats, and we manage controls. And I have a short practical demo as well using ArchMate. Let me just uh, take the laser pointer as well. So a very short practical demo and some conclusions and common pitfalls that I also would like to present to you. So as an introduction, uh, threat modeling, um, I hope you all know it. I ho hope you all know about solution threat modeling. And typically a solution threat model, in my experience, is focused on a single solution. And here on the, on the right of the slide, I just have a, an example, which we will not cover any more in detail in this talk. But we have DFDs, or I've used the DFD here to actually uh, model a solution with the threats, with some controls, with the assets uh, that may be relevant. And typically we use uh, different notations. Uh, so DFDs are, are ones of the, the most known in this context, but we can use UML diagrams as well. We can use Visio documents even. It doesn't really matter. We also can use various techniques uh, like Stride, Linden. There are many more, perhaps you use them. That's not what I will be talking about today, but you will see that there are a lot of um, similarities with architectural threat modeling as I presented here. But most importantly, and, and that's I, I hope something that, uh, that you can take away, there, there are also uh, important differences. So if we look at, uh, at the software development lifecycle, a typical software development lifecycle is displayed here, and perhaps you use uh, some kind of uh, agile model, but I put a, a nice repetition arrow here which basically covers everything, right? So uh, it's easy. But we typically do solution threat modeling in the design phase. Uh, so we, we gather the requirements, then we have the design, and then we should be doing threat modeling. 
And again, this is not something that all companies do already. So solution treadmill is a must and, and you should be doing it. Um, during the design phase, then we go to build, test, move to production, etc. This I assume you know. And if I may make an analogy with, uh, with the farming business, I'm not sure if it's a good one, but okay, analogies are always nice. Then typically, if you use uh, solution threat modeling, it will help you in designing a barn securely. It will help you in designing a solution, one single solution securely. Now, typically as, as enterprise security architects, and, and I actually asked uh, you, as some of you answered the poll before this talk, whether in your company you make the difference between architectural threat modeling and solution threat modeling. And I see that many of you actually make that difference. So that's, that's nice to see. Uh, and so I guess you, you understand when I talk about, uh, perhaps you do not want to build a single barn, a single solution, but instead you would like to, to architect an entire farm, right? Like you see here with a windmill, with, with chickens and, and people and, and buildings uh, and a nice fence. And as an enterprise architect, and I'm not yet talking about security architecture, but as an enterprise architect, you attempt to make a model you try to architect this entire form. And as an enterprise security architect, you will try to use business attributes, uh, that attributes that are important to the business, and you would like them to traceably link to some of the deep down security controls that you have in your solutions. So this is basically my starting point. How can we do threat modeling at this level, at the level of the form, instead of at the level of the, of the barn. And so as a software architect, and there are different names, say in some companies it's called solution architecture, solution security architecture, software security architect. These people typically help to design a single barn, a single solution. And that's ideal to actually use solution threat modeling. So when I talk about, again, solution threat modeling, is it's a threat modeling that we all know uh, with the DFDs and all the like. Using this kind of threat modeling, a solution security architect is able to define system uh, security controls, development security controls, which are very important. So they are extremely important. And it's at the level of the solution. On the right of this slide, you see enterprise security architecture. It's not better, it's not worse. It's just a different role with different goals and different responsibilities. And this kind of person helps design a complete farm. And our argument is that actually this kind of person can employ architectural threat modeling, what we're gonna present in this uh, slideshow to actually reach that objective. And that's one of the very important differences, in my view, uh, between uh, the, the solution threat modeling and the architectural threat modeling. The actual goals of architectural threat modeling are much different. And we want to define security objectives, security principles, and more generic security controls. So we are at, at a higher uh, level of abstraction compared to uh, the solution architecture. So again, on the left, you see here the, the, the SDLC, where we do solution threat modeling, that's uh, designing a single barn. But the argument of this presentation of this talk is we also need to threat model at the enterprise architecture layer. And we all do it. It's the same with, with solution threat modeling. Everybody does it. Perhaps we just do not do it formally, or we do not have a formal method that we follow. But everyone threat models also enterprise security architects threat model. In this talk, I would like to present a more uh, methodic, uh, more strict approach to that kind of threat model. This is a bit of a theoretical slide to see, okay, what we are discussing here, does it actually, it, or is it backed up by literature? Is it backed up by frameworks like TORAF, SAPSA, Zachman? And to be honest, I, I, I'm not sure that I, that I was allowed to show the SAPSA matrix. You can just find it on the internet. Um, but I, I did make the attempt to, to check the licensing uh, of SAPSA. 
and it was a bit unclear. I also did not ask them because I guess I, I would would have been allowed to to use it. But in talks and, and trainings, it's not allowed just like that. So that's why I blurred it. Uh, but you can also uh, duck, duck, go it um, if you would like to. And in fact, SAPSA is much, uh, or, or the SAPSA matrix is very similar to the Zachman uh, matrix. But on the left there, we have TORAF, uh, where we have an architecture continuum and a solutions continuum. This is not a talk about TORAF. If you don't know it, it's not that, uh, that much of a problem. But what we see is that actually, um, all of these frameworks, TORAF, SAPSA, Zachman, they make a difference between the higher layer uh, architectures and the more solution focused architecture. If we have talked about solution threat modeling in the past, again, we see that the threat modeling is more at this solution architecture uh, layer and not at the enterprise architecture layer. You also see the goals again, they are different at, at an enterprise architecture layer. We would like to, to come up with threats, with risks, uh, with, with generic principles that can be used in SAPSA. Uh, we call it the contextual, conceptual, and, and, and also logical layer. Whereas the solution architecture is more the, the physical and the, uh, and the component layers. So all of this just to say that, okay, we have investigated this as well. And we've seen that actually all of these frameworks support uh, this kind of distinction in layers uh, for threat modeling. If we now go to a, to a more concrete example um, that, that we can use throughout this talk, Again, I, I have focused on cloud service models because I think it's a question that all of us face at some point in time and that all of us can also relate to. If we have to choose between a cloud service model as a company, do we have to choose IaaS? Do we have to choose PaaS? Can we use all of them interchangeably? We have to have a reasoning to actually um, explain to the business why or why not we can use a certain service model and which principles we then must be following. And for me, this is a perfect example of where uh, architectural threat modeling can come into, into play. So I, I do not um, well pretend to, to be a, a cloud expert. I also do not pretend that, that, that I know more about these, uh, this, the, the, what the cloud is than, than all of you. Uh, but this is just uh, the essential characteristics, the service models and the deployment models, uh, the, the NIST definitions of a cloud, basically. But what's more important is here on the right, I copied uh, a matrix uh, from Microsoft, uh, which is often known as, as the shared responsibility model. So depending on which service model you choose, you see SaaS, PaaS, EaaS here, depending on which service model you use, you have different responsibilities or better said, the responsibilities may shift to the cloud provider. This makes a lot of sense. Eh? So for example, if, if, you, if you move to the cloud, whether it's IaaS, PaaS or SaaS, the first thing that is out of your control is the data center. So that's also the first thing that is actually the responsibility of your provider. And that's what we mean with the, with the shared responsibility model information and data almost always remains your responsibility as a, as a cloud customer that remains your responsibility but often at the the infrastructure the data center the physical network etc that shifts the management of that shifts to the cloud provider all of this just to set the scene at what i would like to do uh, as or, or to show as an example of architectural threat modeling so, okay, and now, now, we can, uh, now we can dive into it a bit. Um, if you want to do architectural threat modeling, uh, there are several steps that you need to take. And that's very important. And they are pretty uh, similar, again, to the default traditional threat model steps that you need to take. Step zero for me is, is very important. Uh, it's actually to define a meta model, to come to a common uh, uh, terminology that you can use throughout the enterprise, perhaps even across enterprises. That, that's what we see more and more often, also thanks to conferences like this, that even we want to, to share information, to share threat models uh, across organizations. 
Well, to me, that requires a, a shared meta model, a common meta model. And again, there are actually some initiatives listed here that um, uh, define these common meta models, of which one of the most important ones is the ISSRM paper. Uh, so you can also find the references on the slide where they define really, okay, what is important and what do we need in an information system security uh, context? And we need the business asset, we need risks, we have impacts, we have threats, we have vulnerabilities. All of these are terms that you're probably familiar with, but that need to be very strictly defined if we start using um, uh, a certain framework, a certain method in a company. There are also some other uh, references. Uh, NIST, Adam Showstack, of course, uh, one of the, the biggest uh, in, in this game. The Open Group as well, that have defined some concepts that are useful for threat modeling. And again, you see actually similar concepts appear, uh, like risks, events, impact, threat events in this case, threat agents. So they make sense, and we can link them to the ISSRM model as well. And then we have Torev and Archimate. And Archimate, uh, well, we'll be using Archimate uh, here because I think it's it's basically the, the standard these days, the de facto modeling standard for enterprise architecture. And so we need to map the, the meta model, the ISSRM meta model, to Archimate as well. And these are some Archimate elements. We will come back to that. It doesn't really, it's not that important for this talk, but we had to make the mapping between ISSRM content. Uh, concept and an Archimate element. And that's basically what you see here on the right of this table. These are the elements that we use in this talk um, and how they map again to the ISSRM uh, concept. So for example, for a threat, we use an event and an actor for a threat event and a threat actor. This may seem um, easy to do and it's not that difficult but you must have this meta model before you can proceed and so what you see here is is actually the meta model that we use uh, it's a bit simplified i, I got rid of the uh, the uh, invisible relations the implicit relations but basically this is a meta model that we have used and that that proved very useful and it also incorporates all of the elements of ISSRM, all of the concepts of ISSRM, but then mapped to the Archimate language. And this meta model is the one that we use. Uh, so what does it say? Okay, we have we have threat events. We focus here on threats, threat agents. And they they can initiate threat events. The threat event typically exploits a vulnerability, etc. And that's why we need security requirements to actually control these vulnerabilities and therefore to control these events that threaten my uh, or the organization's assets. So we talk more, most about the left part, but you will see uh, in the demo that actually I leave the door open to also move towards an impact assessment, which is typically different from threat assessments. Uh, threat assessments, they, they, they typically are about likelihoods, whereas impact assessments, well, they are about impact and you need both to come to a risk. Threat modeling usually focuses on identifying threats, identifying the likelihood of these threats. Then we have step one, and I will show that also a bit in Archimate, but this, these are the screenshots because Archimate can be a bit overwhelming in that case. And the model became a bit bigger than initially um, expected. That's just an example for this talk. But as I mentioned, I, I really liked it. So, so I'm going to keep using it in the future. But here you see how we modeled um, a potential cloud architecture in Archimate. So you see, we have a business process. So we, have, we can have business processes that are supported by applications running in the cloud. And that would then be a SaaS um, service model. We can also just hire a, a fast runtime. Eh? We can use um, Azure Functions, for example, and run an application in this Azure Function. Then we are more in the fast uh, service model. We can just rent uh, a Kubernetes cluster. Then we're more in the CAS service model. We can have, a, I don't know, a PHP platform. Not sure if that's the, the best example. But then you're in PaaS. 
or you can just hire or rent out uh, machines and then you're in an IaaS kind of service model. And so for me, this is very useful because it shows exactly how this is built, not linked to technologies, not linked to, to Azure, to AWS, to Google Cloud. It's just conceptually what makes up a cloud architecture. And so why did we use Archimate? Again, because this is not so easy to do in other notations. So we make the link here between infrastructure architecture to application architecture to business uh, process architecture. It's not easy to, to have this link in other notations. And it is the de facto standard, as I mentioned, in many of the companies that I was able to work with. This is the standard to actually model this kind of, uh, of, of problems. I also have a, have a nice statement, by the way, of Nick Malik at the time when he was working for, for Microsoft, where, and there's a lot of truth in, in this statement, and that's also what, because sometimes people ask me, well, what's the difference between UML, for example, and, and Archimate? Why do we need to use Archimate? I think it's, and there I agree with, with what Nick Malik uh, mentions, it's just a difference in, in what we want to describe. In Archimate, we can describe the form, an entire organization, Whereas you need UML for the more detailed design, uh, the, the single solutions that you want to design, like sequence diagrams, state diagrams, uh, all of these things, they are very important if you focus on one single solution. And both are indeed needed. So it's not that the one replaces the other, uh, not at all. So step one is done. We have a model. We have an architectural model in Archimate. And here you see again these different uh, service models. So you see that, that I was uh, a bit uh, caught up in, in, in this because, uh, again, I, I think it's, it's useful for the future as well. Uh, it's just a shared responsibility model, but then modeled in Archimate conceptually, not by Microsoft, not by any other vendor, but just a conceptual model that, that uh, we could use in this threat model exercise. So, okay, then we are at step two, and now we can identify threats. Uh, we just follow the methodology, and we always start with threat actors, but threat actors, it's not the core of this talk. I want to focus on threat events uh, in this talk, but anyway, we need to, or we cannot ignore threat actors. So here I gave some examples of potential threat actors, and I really like the open security architecture, um, OSA threat classification method. It's to classify threats, not just threat actors, but thanks to, to, to actually this method, we can also uh, apply it to the threat actors. So for example, we have internal threat actors, we have external threat actors. Some of them can be, um, uh, can really be deliberately attempting to attack our organization. Some of them can actually just, well, they, they can make an accident, which also has impact to our organization. And we can also have some more force majeure uh, kind of, of threats like an earthquake perhaps or, or something like that. So these are our threat actors. Very important uh, to, to think about this. Is the NSA your threat actor? Uh, is it a hobby attacker? Is it an internal employee? That's all very important. It can even lead to, to some, some red teaming uh, scenarios, etc. based on uh, who are you afraid of or who um, do you think may be uh, attacking you. But now we move to actually the core slide of what I want to show. And again, I, I will also attempt to, to show it a bit in, in a demo kind of way. But here you already see it and, and there's a lot of on this slide. But what is, what is shown here is actually the end result of a threat model session. So what you see here, and I'm circling it, I hope you see my, uh, my laser pointer. What you see here is, is our cloud architecture, uh, the infrastructure layer, the application layer, the business process layer. We have here the service models. That's what we discussed uh, a couple of slides ago. And on the right, we have the threats, which are the result of a threat session. Uh, so I uh, could have a threat session with, with Matthias and we come up with all of these threats and we link them uh, to a certain component, a certain element in this architecture. Uh, so that we actually know which threats apply depending on which service model that you use. 
You see also that there are some common threads, by the way, here in the system thread profile that apply to any kind of system. Um, but okay, let's, let's ignore these for now. How did we come to these threads? Because again, uh, there is not much difference. Could we have used Stride? Perhaps we could, but the thing that I don't like about Stride is that it's too open. And some people actually like it because it's open and because you have to spark creativity and, and you have to indeed uh, be able to, to have a brainstorming session. But in reality, if, if I really have to do it consistently across different architectural e enterprise architectural projects, I think it's good to have some kind of thread catalog a reference that we that we use a very uh, a very good resource for architectural thread modeling that we found is the capic mechanisms of attack and i, I will show you that uh, also during the the short demo capic it's, it's a miter resource so we all know miter from uh, the, the miter attack framework i guess but they also have, have a capic um, a common attack pattern enumeration um, and, and classification where they actually uh, categorize all the threads that they also have in the attack framework in some kind of patterns, meta patterns, meta patterns that we can very well use in an architectural threat model session. I'll show you that list uh, later. We can optionally cross-reference it with the Kawi catalog and if we have time, I could uh, show you that. That's just a paper where somebody actually made the effort already to go through CAPEC, through all of the uh, attack patterns of CAPEC, and filter out the ones that are more enterprise architecture related. So uh, let's say that CAPEC mentions a C-surf attack, which is actually an attack. So attack threats, some people would like to also to have a discussion, maybe a discussion we have at the end of this session. But a C-surf attack to me should not be a threat that we model in an architectural threat model session. Uh, we should more talk about um, uh, higher level meta patterns. And that's what we're going to do. But the Kawe uh, paper actually already does that for you. So they have made a, a list, a filtered list of CAPEC, which they think is important at an architectural uh, level. And of course, as we always do with threat modeling, we have to analyze the threat in the context uh, of this model. What you perhaps also see here, but again, I will show it also in, in Archie, and then we can dive a bit deeper into it, is that we linked uh, multiple threads to thread profiles uh, just to make it a bit more um, uh, well to make the overview a bit more clear so that we don't have to link all of these threads to to single elements in the cloud architectural uh, model so again uh, this uh, for me is, is a core deliverable of enterprise architecture why because now you can say okay we have and we'll, we'll, we'll come to the controls in a minute but now you can say, okay, if I am doing pass, well, then these are the threads. So all the ones below pass, all of these threads should be solved by my cloud provider. Are they solved? You should check it. And either it's contractually agreed. I know it's difficult uh, with, uh, with the big players like Azure and, and, and Amazon. You're not always in the position to, to negotiate. But anyway, you should be aware of these threats and you should at least document that it is assumed or that it is known that these threats are uh, in fact mitigated by our or by your cloud provider. All of the ones on top of it, so if you go for pass, all of these threats that are uh, above the pass uh, line should be solved by you, should be controlled by you. And so this is ideal to come up with some controls, some cloud security controls. And we have cloud controls matrices, of course. We have an ESA uh, top 10. Uh, they should be aligned with each other. And these are the threats that we need to protect against um, from an enterprise architectural level. Step three then is to actually control them, uh, to, to identify controls. And this is a step that was not completed here in this presentation because I want to focus on the threat identification. And that, that's what threat modeling is about, identify the threats. Of course, in the end, you should end up with a set of controls that you have to apply. 
but that was not the main goal of this uh, talk. So what you see here is that the purple things are actually the control profiles. So for each threat profile, we have a control profile, but you see that I only identified two concrete controls. And just in this example, uh, where we have controls that are actually attempting to mitigate some of these threats bundled together in a control profile. This is what I mentioned. So depending on the service model that we choose or that you choose, either you or the service provider will be responsible to actually make sure these controls are in place. And the threat actors are also not seen here. Why? Because, well, in this, this is actually a comparison exercise. So we compare paths with EAs and CAS, etc. So the threat actors can shift if you go for on-prem. You do not need to worry about a cloud uh, administrator, for example. So that's why they shift uh, in this example. Now, okay, enough, enough of, the, of the talk. Let, let's, let's just show some examples because I think it's, it's very useful. Um, and I, I want to start from the CAPIC mechanisms, just to show you that, and perhaps some of you already know it. Uh, but so I have the CAPIC um, mechanisms of attack. So it's just a, a resource of MITRE, as I mentioned. And what's very important or, or very useful is that they actually have categories. So the C is a category. It's not really an, an attack category. It's more categorized based on intent. Uh, but okay, it's, it's very useful to have this. But what's even more useful is these meta attack patterns. This is what we need at an architectural level. So for example, uh, uh, bypassing physical security is a meta attack per pattern. I'm not sure if you can, you can read it. It's pretty small, uh, but I will quote, meta level attack patterns are particularly useful for architectural threat modeling exercises. That's what we, what we need it for. And that's what we use it for indeed um, in this talk. If you even click further, you go to the standard attack pattern. And these, for me, are too detailed. So that's useful in a solution threat model session, perhaps. But it's too detailed in a architectural threat modeling session. So I really like these mechanisms of attack, uh, and especially these meta uh, attack patterns. For me, they make up the threat catalog, the standard threat catalog for many organizations uh, out there. And so you can build your own threat catalog, but I think and MITRE is, is very known, and, and perhaps it, the site is, is not uh, doesn't look like like uh, the most modern one. But the content is great uh, of of this uh, of this list. Now, what we usually do, and and that's something that that I should add, is actually uh, you see an Excel here. I will zoom in just a tiny bit. In column F, you see these meta attack patterns. Um, but what we usually do is, OK, we still translate them here in column D to a more uh, to, to a threat in our own wording, because it may be easier to manage definitions yourself and to make sure they align with, with definitions of, of the company that you work in, uh, rather than actually reusing directly the meta attack pattern definitions, because there may sometimes be differences in opinion or differences in, 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 in concepts that, uh, that CAPEC is using uh, uh, in contrast to what you're using in your organization. So usually we, we translate them still to a threat um, and sometimes even we split them. And so flooding in the context of cloud, it's not just DDoS, but it's also that your, that your resources can be exhausted, that you perhaps chose a machine that is too lightweight, can also be a threat to, to availability. And so that's just a simple translation. You don't need to do it. You can use the meta attack patterns directly, but that's what we like to do. Here, by the way, I will come back because you see that there is no uh, meta attack pattern linked. And this Excel, so I'm going to switch to uh, the Archie tool now. These patterns, and I hope it's large enough, but I will, uh, I will also just explain what's on the screen. All of the threads that you saw in the Excel are also returning here. So I just imported them from the Excel into my architectural thread model. In your organization, if you have a common repository of architectural artifacts, these threads could be part of your uh, common repository. 
And it's these threat events that we can actually easily link to some kind of elements. So let me just show you a, a very quick demo eh, because the cloud example was perhaps uh, a bit too big uh, for some of you to see. But for example, if imagine that we need a logging component and, and I'm not going to uh, talk about tooling, so we're, we're at the enterprise or architectural level. Let's say that we need to introduce a logging component. Uh, it's, it's an application component. And we want to threat model it. So we organize a session uh, with, with architects and we use the CAPIC threat catalog. And we actually say, okay, I guess that um, for these, this, this logging system, well, traffic can be intercepted perhaps. And so that's a potential threat to the logging component. I link it. Uh, I usually use the association relationships. We can, we can have a discussion on it, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a potential uh, threat. Or an easy one, uh, loss of compromise uh, or loss or compromise of logs. Okay, I also link it to this uh, component. And then, of course, uh, we, we have to, to follow our meta model, by the way. So this, this actually is following our meta model. And I have a small script as well that actually um, sets some properties on these relations. Why? Because again, I think we need to move to a more strict methodology, a more stricter approach to, to this architectural threat modeling. And you see that uh, I now added properties of likelihood and impact of this um, uh, threat. So for example, at the interception of traffic, it's a likely threat with a medium impact. I don't know, it's just an example. And we can even add some context, uh, traffic, um, logs going to the logging component can easily or can be intercepted. This may have a medium impact because of the content of the logs. Just a quick example. And so that's how we document our entire threat model in this architectural uh, model. And of course, the next step is then to start defining controls. So that was step three. Let's identify controls. By the way, I skipped uh, the threat actor phase. But in this case, let's say we have an uh, internal malicious employee who is uh, possibly initiating these threat events. And then we can have some, some requirements. Uh, we can protect logging uh, data in transit. And according to the meta model, that's an implicit relation. I can also link it directly to this connection, not to the threat, because depending on the context, the, the control can be different. And so it's not that the control solves the entire threat. You typically need a contextualized um, uh, control to actually solve this uh, threat or mitigate this threat. And this is an easy um, a threat model. And so it's similar to the one of the cloud. We can even have some, some other controls uh, for this compromise of logs. I don't know, require authentication. Okay, this is not really the greatest threat model of my life, but you see the point where we actually add controls in step three to this threat model. And that's just the approach that I would like to, to, to get more accustomed to, uh, to have this more strict method. And what's great is that typically we also need to generate um, a traceability matrix. Well, uh, we can use scripting in Archie to actually generate, auto-generate this threat uh, traceability matrix. Sorry, I will show it again. So I just ran the script and then it copies all of this information to the clipboard. And you see here that we have the logging component with two threads. Um, and also we have for each thread uh, an, uh, a control that was identified. We could even use this to assess risk yeah, because now we have the likelihood that's typically related to the threat, but we can also have the impact. That's what I added on these connections uh, because the logging component, it may have a medium impact. So we could actually use this as well to move to risks. And then we have the full meta model Let's see if I still have it here. Then we can actually start building this meta model concretely um, 
uh, in, in this, uh, this example of the logging component. Okay, so um, just as a final example, I will show this threat model of the cloud again. So it's exactly the same, and we have these elements, and I linked uh, threats to the elements through a control profile, or sorry, a threat profile, doesn't really matter, and we could also have linked them directly, which is exactly what we also did here in this logging component uh, example. So I hope it's a bit clear, uh, but this is actually what we uh, present. And of course, this is architectural uh, threat modeling as we see it. Let me switch back to the slides. So, okay, we've done a lot. Eh? So um, start from the CAPIC mechanisms. Uh, I've shown you that, so I'm not gonna repeat it. I told you that the meta patterns is actually what we need in an architectural threat modeling session. But the standard patterns, they can be still very useful uh, in a more detailed solution threat model. Here, I also used Archie uh, to, to actually do this in practice. Uh, so it doesn't have to be Archie, but that's an open source uh, tool, again, uh, used in, in, in many enterprises, but can also be Sparks or whatever. And I auto-generated this traceability matrix uh, from the model which is great for documentation and which immediately can show you, okay, we have no controls for all of these threats, but that's a problem because if I take, for example, EAS, I'm actually responsible for all of these controls. And so we have to define these generic controls, perhaps even principles and objectives to make sure that we make the correct choice and that we uh, treat these, uh, these, these cloud service models securely. So, okay, uh, a, lot, a lot of talking. It's, it's always uh, a bit strange to not see your audience or to not get, uh, get immediate feedback. Yeah, but uh, let, let me jump to the, to the conclusions um, and some of the potential pitfalls that you can also face. Alan, I think I still have some time uh, to, to further yes. all these conclusions. Correct, for the Q&A. So far, no questions. So okay. uh, the audience can, uh, can not be afraid to per questions we'll have enough time back to you michael thanks thanks so yeah indeed ask ask questions it's uh, it's great uh, i think to to have this kind of uh, interactive uh, sessions but so the main conclusions so in this talk i focused on on the layering uh, so most on the architectural uh, layer actually where we said okay this is also supported by Torgaf, by sapsa by zachman uh, and all the like where we now focus on the contextual, conceptual, and logical layers, whereas typical solution threat modeling is more focusing on the bottom layers. But a question that I, that I get often, and that I also often think about is, what exactly is the difference with solution threat modeling and with the threat modeling as we know it? And I think the main differences are in the scopes and the goals of what we want to do with architectural threat modeling. And because the scope and these goals are different, we must move to other techniques. We must move to other um, uh, notations to be able to link it to what enterprise architects do in, in their day-to-day -day, uh, jobs. So to summarize, the methodology is, I think, similar. I would love to have it a bit stricter, and that's also what, what is presented here. It, it's, it's, it's not a free-for-all anymore, it's more strict. And I think it's also different techniques that we use. Archimate, Torgaf, again, actually you could do this also with other notations, but again, I think we should attempt to, to standardize uh, as much as possible. Oza and, and the CAPIC library of MITRE are, are very uh, thankful um, uh, resources that you can use in practice. And for the controls, again, that was not the focus of this talk, but I think uh, since we have here I, I showed you how we can automate this generation of, of threats of traceability matrices. Perhaps we can even automate the generation of controls in the future. Uh, looking at OSCAL, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if any of you have worked with it, but it's also a way to, to actually represent controls 
in a more computer readable language, uh, you could say. So it may be possible to actually start integrating with that automatically uh, as well. Perhaps a talk for a, in a couple of years. Uh, again, for me, the main differences is the scope. Uh, so we focus here on enterprise architecture deliverables. We're not focusing on detailed design. What do I mean with enterprise architecture deliverables? It's reference architectures. It's, it's architectural patterns that we actually want to assess, that we want to tread model before we validate them for use, uh, for generic use in an enterprise. The goals are also different. The goals from architectural threat modeling, to me, they are defining security principles, objectives directly linked to the business attributes um, where it all starts. We also need some traceability, as sometimes people may ask you, hey, but why do we have this detailed security requirement, um, for example, of having to, to, to be, to be re-authenticated after uh, 30 minutes? Well, you should be able to use the architectural threat models to actually jump from the from the deep down security requirement to the objective uh, principles, the goals that we want to achieve. And so I hope that with this talk, I showed you how we can facilitate threat modeling for enterprise security architects. Um, that was the main goal. That's how we also use it. And I think it's, it's, it's very useful uh, like that. Last slide, uh, Alan, and then let's see if, if there are some questions in the meantime, yeah. but some common, some common pitfalls to avoid. Eh? So, so we have run into some, some of these uh, ourselves. So to save you from them, I think it's important to try to avoid these. Uh, and, and, and an example is, is the overlapping threads. Depending on the catalogs that you use, you can have many overlapping threads. Uh, some threads, they actually are the same uh, as another one but try to avoid it by tracking related threats. If you really want to use multiple resources, CAPIC can perhaps extend it with some other uh, threat catalogs, try to identify the related threats upfront. Um, not gonna go over all of them, but, but one, another one that I think is very important is missing threats. So in, in CAPIC, CAPIC is based on attack, uh, on attacks. But there are threats which are not necessarily always linked to an attack. For me, an, an, an attack is kind of a subset of, of, of threats. But there are also non-attack threats, like uh, and OSA calls them more technology threats and the force majeure threats. That's also what you saw in my Excel list, where there was no link to a CAPIC threat. Well, those are mentioned here, and you should be aware of them, and you should not ignore them. But in practice, I think it's usually a limited set of threats that you can also build up front and add to your threat catalog uh, independently of the CAPIC threats. Um, the last one that, that I want to, to mention is the paralysis by analysis uh, uh, kind of, uh, I'm not sure if I can call it a theorem, but we as, or, or you as security experts, uh, we typically have a, have a good understanding of technology and we want to analyze things more and more in depth, but we should attempt to, especially in architectural threat modeling, we should attempt to avoid that by communicating also with the business-minded business, uh, business minded people who will actually be able to tell you what, the, what they see as a problem. And, and then we touch on the sub sub business attributes, which is uh, perhaps for, for another talk as well. But that's something to watch out for. Sometimes you have to say, okay, we have these threats, they may not be 100% exhaustive. They may not always be 100% correct even, but we have the threats. Let's now start defining the controls so that we end up with some principles that we can use uh, in practice. So thanks. Uh, so here you see my bio. I'm not gonna go over it, uh, but I'm curious to see, uh, Alan, if, if we have some questions in, in the meantime. Yes, so uh, there were two questions that came in. Uh, the topic was layered threat modeling, and the question is solution threat modeling versus architectural, I suppose, enterprise threat modeling. Yeah, you presented the, the two at the beginning. So the net net is can these be done or should they be done independently or in conjunction? 
Uh, well, th that's that's indeed a good question, and and I think it it depends a bit, but I don't think they always should be done in conjunction. I think you can see them indeed as as different layers. And typically in enterprise architecture, you start with reference architectures with patterns, etc. And those ones you can model, you can thread model. And the solutions, there can be many solutions making use of similar reference architectures. And for all of these solutions, you, sh you should be doing solution thread modeling. Mm -hmm. But they can refer back to a similar architectural thread model uh, session mm -hmm. in which the reference architecture was, uh, was assessed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, then the second question uh, has to do uh, uh, is the following. Is the approach presented tooling dependent or is it compatible with other tooling like uh, Sparks systems? Yeah, well, so, so here I, um, I, shown, I showed you indeed uh, Archie and because it's open source, it, it's, it's, it's easy to use. Uh, I'm not saying that, that that tool is fully enterprise ready. So indeed Sparks and, and Mega or whatever other toolings, they may be a bit more enterprise ready because they have a shared repository. But I don't think it, it matters that much. Eh? So, okay, we have some scripts that we use to export this table automatically. Mm -hmm. It's not that, that, that you cannot do this in other toolings. Eh? So it, it's not, not tooling dependent. No, you, you can you can use this approach in any kind of tool that you use uh, for enterprise architecture. Okay, thank you. Um, the audience, are there any, we still have a bit some time here. Uh, we have 10 minutes before the end of the session. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? I think you have to use the Hoover platform, but... Uh, I can also take a look at the Wuva yeah. platform, but yeah. they should be coming in. I see actually some questions in, in the in the Wuva platform, Alan. I'm not sure ah. if you see them. Um, but probably I didn't. Uh, so so let, let me go over them because indeed I see some questions and we still have a couple of minutes. Yes. So um, I see the first question here, how often do enterprise threat models get updated? Uh, what are the triggers? How do changes get propagated towards the solution level? Uh, very good question. And, 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 and that's, um, I'm not sure that I will be able to answer that immediately. It, it, as usual, it, it depends. But what, what we found as, as uh, something that, that may work um, is actually to, to at least review them manually. Uh, perhaps that's, that, that's normal. Um, and the triggers are typically if you start seeing that things start to go wrong. So uh, and that's where you have to, where you need a feedback loop. If you start seeing that during your penetration testing, during your red teaming, you, you, we, we start missing more and more threats or there are more and more successful attacks perhaps from your bug bounty platform, they should actually feed back to the enterprise architecture level where we say, okay, this capability, it seems to be missing eh, because we keep on having problems there. So let's start focusing. Perhaps we need a, a new reference architecture on uh, whatever uh, component that we use. So kind of a high level answer. Eh? I realize that, but this is also a very difficult question to answer. But I guess if you have the correct feedback loop, that's very important. And that can be one input to know when you should be updating uh, some of the threat models uh, that you already have in your organization. Um, let's see, how do you create modeling out of existing big applications? I'm not yeah. sure if I, if I understand the question entirely. Uh, I'm also not going to interpret it. So for the person who asked it, uh, if you can elaborate it a bit, I will come back to it. Can you recommend certification material for architectural threat modeling? Um, well, of course, Archimate, I think is, is key. And I, and I don't wanna, well, I actually like Archimate and but there may be other notations, but you can get certified in, in Archimate. I think that's, that's an important prerequisite uh, that you need to know uh, the notation that you are using. Um, but for the rest, uh, there are not many threat modeling certifications that I know of. There are many good books. Uh, so I think you should always 
start also from the solution threat modeling. Uh, the, the book of Adam Shostak, for example, is, is, a, is a no brainer to, to, to read. You should be reading it. Um, but I don't know any uh, certification material, official certification for really architectural threat modeling. Maybe an ID to, to start with it uh, uh, to the person who asked it. Does the tool and methodology you described work for non-architecture as well? Yes, of course. So this was just an example um, uh, that I created for this talk. Uh, again, I'm going to keep using it. Um, but this was just an example that I created. But you can apply it also to non-cloud architectures, for sure. Uh, you also have non-cloud reference architectures, perhaps on your... Uh, on your API stuff with, with gateways and, and, and controls that you want uh, at, at microservice level or perhaps at gateway level. That's for me also an enterprise architectural um, uh, discussion, a reference architecture that you need uh, without, regardless whether it's cloud or not. So, so yes, of course, this should also work for non-cloud architectures. Um, Will architectural threat modeling free myself from solution threat modeling? No, uh, not at all. Eh? So this is two independent things with two different goals. It's very important to do both. But as, as was discussed in, in the first uh, question, uh, you do not necessarily for each solution have to do architectural threat modeling. Eh? You can probably reuse um, for many solutions the same reference architecture the same reference pattern so short short answer to the question no you still need solution threat modeling um, are there any open and similar alternatives to archie that are hosted or automatable well a very good question there are many alternatives to archie uh, but most of them are pretty expensive um, Sparks is, I think, the, the most uh, known one that uh, Alan also mentioned in, in one of the questions. Um, and they are hosted. I'm not sure if you mean cloud hosted or on premise, uh, but um, you, I think you can choose with Sparks, but I'm not a tooling expert in, in all of the tools. Um, but there, there are many architectural, well, there are many alternative toolings that you can use to, to actually uh, model Archimate. Archimate is a, is a notation. Archie is just one of the tools that you can use to build Archimate models. The existing application is complex and not sure from where to start to create modeling. I guess that's related to the question that I did not understand completely. Um, uh, but yeah, for me, that's actually a question about architecture. So if you start from an existing application, it's typically easier to start with the, with the, uh, with the structure. Uh, what application do you have? A structure, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a definition in, in Archie, uh, Archie made. But if you allow me, I will skip this question in the interest of time. I see that there is one more. Uh, we have one minute left. Yes. Engineers, developers tend not to use Archie or UML. Uh, these days, preferring light modeling. Uh, yeah, the cloud providers don't use it in their architecture material, as far as I know. Does a heavy tool like Archie, ArchMate, alienate engineers, developers, given the learning curve? Oh, this is a, a very nice question. Um, I think we need something. And, and again, that's why we have these layers. I don't say that developers need to create these models. I still think even in the agile world, we have several roles to play and we have enterprise or people working at the enterprise architecture level who can use Archie and Archie made. But indeed, they should be translated to some detailed design models that developers use slash generate. So I have never said, and I don't want to say, although it may be nice in the shift left uh, approach, that developers should be actually modeling or creating these models. And I'm sorry, but this is an interesting question, but I guess we, we've run out of uh, time. Alan. Yeah. Um, we are running out of time. Would you like just to use the last 30 seconds to maybe summarize with one or two key message? Um, well, I guess the, the main, the, the key message is here. So keep on doing the solution threat modeling. Uh, that's what's related to the question, but also start thinking about architectural threat modeling. Uh, and, and hopefully you can use some of the material that was presented here. 
I can definitely share some of it as well. I will see how, how I do it, but then you will, uh, you will see it also in the Wuva application. Okay, thank you, Michael. We have to close now. Uh, there are five concurrent sessions that are happening in parallel. The next session that will be starting on this, um, uh, this room here will be Trusted Types, a world without uh, XSS. Thank you, Michael, and thank all you. the rest. Yeah. And see you soon, maybe in Belgium. Thank you, indeed. Have a nice day, Alan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.